a period in time when we were living in a historical moment and didn't know it. Because the city was, you know, on the cusp, was bubbling. We're on this big stage now, we've said it. Let's live up to it now, right? The stars are The only way you could have got what happened in Atlanta in the 90s is if you wrote it in a movie. We are the city that refuses to be diverted from the positive path that stretches clearly before us. We are the city that refuses to be divided by forces that do not realize that this is a new day. We are the city that refuses to despair but continues to hope. We are the city whose people refuse to become bogged down in the mire of demagoguery and inflammatory rhetoric. And like the Phoenix, which is a symbol of our city, today we have arisen from the ashes of a very bitter campaign to build a better life for all Atlantans. Maynard Jackson was in his 30s when he was elected mayor the first time. So he was young, he was bold, he was willing to challenge the status quo uh, in, in ways that government had not been challenged. And this is after the Voting Rights Act, this is the after the Civil Rights Act, but he actually came in in the 70s and said, we can do things better. For me, I think our biggest export is just this, um, the spirit of disruption, you know, this spirit of just not being satisfied with the way things are from you know, Martin Luther King to the other great civil rights leaders that just kind of saw the way things were and it started here. By the time you get to the 90s, we're a generation that's standing on the shoulders of a normal lifestyle that where we've seen people who look like us be successful. Atlanta's been about the business of being better and of being ahead of the curve. What the 90s gave us was an opportunity to fulfill the expectations of the civil rights movement. And the expectations were for us to take every opportunity we had to be better educated, every opportunity we had, and not better educated meaning white educated, meaning your little ass already was educated, now you're gonna be better educated because the school you're gonna go to is gonna be named for David Howard, who was a poor man who started a mortuary service, who left, who died rich and left his, left his school and all his grounds to black folks in the Fort Ward. It's gonna be more like Frederick Douglass, the most photographed man of the 1800s, you know, Barack Obama and better of his time. Your rival is gonna be Benjamin E. Mays, who's the president of Morehouse College. When you name for schools that are named for the greatest amongst you, you gotta step up and do the greatest. So the expectation in Atlanta has always been here. And I think in the 90s, what we did was we grappled that expectation and we figured our way out with it. The energy in the 90s from a kid who got here at 17 was, you couldn't have wrote a better script. It was very special because it was a time of discovery. Atlanta was new. I mean, it was new to, to those that were coming into the city because, you know, we had just gotten the, the bid for the Olympics, but we still had years to build, to build a foundation. But in that, so was the Atlanta music scene. Because the city was, you know, on the cusp, was bubbling. You had like Raheem Dream and Kilo Ali, uh, Jermaine Dupree with Crisscross. Like we were just, you know, starting to get that fire under us. You know what I mean? Um, still had Freak Nick, and it was just all about a good. Atlanta was a, it's a good time, always a good time. But you know, Atlanta was already that city that was attracting a lot of folks. We had the HBCUs here. And you know, something about this city allows people from the outside to integrate themselves really quickly. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and contribute to the culture. It became Atlanta because you take Spelman, Morris Brown, Morehouse, and Clark, you take these places, essentially, when you, when, you, when you get the freedom to party unabated like you do in Atlanta, you're gonna go home and tell folks. So, the AUC works probably the same way Black Twitter does now. People say, Black Twitter? Who is Black Twitter? Does, does Black Twitter have an email? 
black Twitter is culture. It's the virality and the infectiousness of black culture. The AUC was like a microcosm of that. You know what I'm saying? It was a hub of people from all different places who could take these ideas back to other places. When I was in undergraduate school, everybody would take off for spring break. And they would go to these Fort Lauderdale and there were movies about all that. I never went, never had a desire. Wasn't for me. Go to Freak Me, that's for me. <laughs> First word comes to mind is fun. It was fun because the city was fun, but also that was when I was coming of age, graduating high school in 92. So the whole 90s, I had a driver's license. And I was able to go anywhere I wanted to go, whether I was riding motor or driving or hanging out with friends, the city was on buzz. What Freak Neek brought was freedom of expression, uh, ability to promote your music, you know, while you was wilding out, and it brought commerce. Because those, whether it was the clubs or the t-shirts or the barbershops or beauty shops or the restaurants, money got spent here. And it got understood that young black people can come and spend money. Now, it got real wild and caused a lot of traffic jams, which is why I think ultimately Mayor Phil Campbell had to say, hey, we didn't, we didn't freak neat enough. We gonna find a new way to freak neat, which led Blossom to the opening of more clubs and entertainment centers. But Freak Neek was a very important part of Atlanta in the 90s because it was the way the music got spread. It was the way that people from different parts of the country who looked like one another got a chance to find out what was going on and take that talk. So a lot of people moved to Atlanta because of their Freak Neek experience. The creative climate in Atlanta was just bubbling. You knew that there was something special here. You just couldn't really put your finger on exactly what it was. But the beauty of it was is that the Atlanta music scene was building as the city was building. And we had somewhat of, I would call it a resurrection. You know, everybody always talk, talk about Atlanta hip hop and say, man, the, the thing that makes Atlanta different, man, them cats work together. The camaraderie. I mean, this might be a little beef here and there, but you know, it's power numbers. And like, the more you mess with this person, that person, you can come up with something totally different than what you're already doing, you know what I mean? So they need to keep that going. With the, with the hype going on around Pastor Troy and everything, they reached out to me to be the headliner for birthday bands. Master P gets when that they want me to headline the show and had me removed from the concert. And the city just really didn't like that, man. You know what I mean? Everybody, that was gonna be my first real show in Atlanta, man. Goody Ma reached out to me, man. They called me. Yo, hey, yo, man, this big gift. I heard they took you off the show, man. Meet us over the dungeon. You coming to perform with us. Man, when we got there, the crowd just going crazy, saying we ready, but nobody knew I was there to perform. CeeLo came out on the stage and was like, ATL, man, let me tell y'all something. One thing about Atlanta, we stick together. Can't nobody come from out of town and take nobody off no show in Atlanta. We won. With that being said, come on, Troy. And they called me out and let me perform No More Playing GA. ATL history, man. To see 20, 30,000 people go absolutely bananas, it was so dope, man. It was just so dope. I think the day that we did that, the city loved Troy even more, and they loved us even more for giving Troy that opportunity. Pre-96 Olympics, it, it it just felt like a hidden gem. And within the city, we knew that it was something intangible that existed here that, you know, the rest of the world probably wasn't aware of. We just didn't know how to put our finger on it or how to articulate it. But I think Outkast did that for us in a way that none of us could have. Closed-minded folks, you know what I'm saying? It's like we got a demo tape and don't nobody want to hear it, but it's like this, the South got something to say. That's all I got to say. Yeah. And so when they won the award, and it, you know, it was just a lot of tension in the air because you had the East Coast, West Coast rivalry brewing. And when they announced that Outkast had won Best New Artist, people started booing. And 
in hindsight, you know, I look back and I was like, okay, I realized they were actually just booing because it probably wasn't a New York artist that had won. It wasn't necessarily that they were booing Outkast. But when they got on stage and Dre uttered those infamous words, the South got something to say. I think at that particular moment, it was like a battery pack for the South. It was a battery pack for Southern culture, for Southern hip hop. To be just as great as we thought and always knew that we were, but now we had this validation, right? It was almost like the source was like the holy grail of like hip hop. Everybody wanted to make five mics from the source, right? We had been validated. We won that award. And it was like, okay, we're not going anywhere. And so it was definitely an opportunity for us to continue to shine. Yeah, 93, 94, the world changed. You know, because Outkast and, and the Dundon family and Organized Noise came. And there was there was dominant music coming out of New York still. We still loved East Coast music if you were at East Coast loving music. You still loved Dre and Snoop for what the West Coast was doing. But what Organized Noise did, what the Dungeon family did, them being mentored by Curtis Mayfield and them turning that mentorship into a sound was they gave Atlanta a sound. That was the genesis. That you know, it wasn't the very beginning of the Atlanta sound, because we had, had sound since Mojo. You know, Kilo, Raheem, Sammy Sam had given a sound, but that was the genesis of who we would become in terms of in terms of culturally, in terms of class, in terms of business, you know, in terms of all that, that is the absolute genesis of it all. But when that organized hit, it was like, oh, we got something that speaks to us now. You know what I mean? That 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 red clay like funk that they had, it just was it was like you never heard anything like it, but it sounded like everything that you would have imagined Atlanta to sound like. The main thing you hear that you hadn't really heard to that degree at that point, they repping Atlanta hard. You know, you heard them mention Hedlin and Delo. I mean, that's my hood. That's where we grew up in those areas. Or you saw, you know, Dre wearing at the A, the Atlanta Braves A, right? And so those became really unique and iconic moments for us, and especially that we're from here, we finally felt like we had someone repping us. They represent, that's, and that's hip hop. Until you representing where you from, you, you might not really be doing hip hop. You could be rapping, and you could be having a lot of success, but it becomes hip hop when you really start repping where you from. After the Source 95, we really, it made us come back to do Goody Mob Al in that way because we were saying, okay, if you didn't understand Alcans, then let's show you another side of it. It made us our best when we walked into the booth because we took the energy of that 95 Source Awards night and we, we wore it on our sleeves and in our heart for at least six or seven albums straight. Folks are trying to figure out what is Outcast doing? Well, they're changing the culture. They're changing it. Well, first of all, I mean, coming from the baseball world, I think um, watching Atlanta in the early 90s, you know, turn the city around from wars to first and then take, you know, get a chance to get to the World Series in a long time. You know, we utilize that long runway, I think, between 1993 to 1996 to really shine a global light on the city. So again, you had Outkast coming out, you had TLC doing their thing, Tony Braxton, and then of course, from a sports perspective, the 1995 Braves, you know, we won our first World Series. It felt, you know, so incredible to finally win that chip. So Atlanta's just like, ugh! <laughs> Right. And then in 96, you get the Olympics. Um, and shortly thereafter, you get ATLians. And so even if you think it's the music, it's the business, and it's the politics and the triangulation of all of those together, I think that's Atlanta's greatest export. So elections are won off of the use of the music and the culture. Sports teams benefit from that triangulation. And so I think that's the part that Atlanta sends out. and doing it in a way that is um, where the ideal is to still promote social change, justice, and equity, and to look good and feel good doing it. In those moments, uh, you, you create a battery almost for, for younger kids to, to see something and to see everything around them and think, okay, I can be bigger than just what's around me. I can do more than like what I've already known. It was all, it just felt like Atlanta was starting to win. 
you know, and you could, it was just this spirit or it was, you know what it was, it was, it was pride. It was pride and we could feel it starting to happen in the music. We could feel it starting to happen in sports. We could feel it starting to happen just in the culture. People just say, the stars align. That's what happened. The stars align. Like, you, the only way you could have got what happened in Atlanta in the 90s is if you wrote it in a movie. The International Olympic Committee has awarded the 1996 Olympic Games to the city of Atlanta. There you have it, the announcement is in. Atlanta, Georgia will be the site of the 1996 Summer Olympics. What a tremendous moment going on right now. I mean, Olympics. the chances of us beating um, Athens, uh, Greece, was slim to none. But what Atlantans did, young and old, black and white, different backgrounds, what they did is they put together kind of a multicultural, multidisciplinary approach to the Olympics, and then added Southern hospitality. And that Southern hospitality actually opened the door um, to a number of the Olympic uh, committee members and really attracted the attention of the world's press. And even though they teased us about the possibility of being the Bubba Games, um, the 96th Centennial Olympics were some of the greatest Olympics that have ever been held and introduced the world to the American South through the eyes of the people who lived here and who loved the place and who had invested in it. When that curtain opened in 1996, Atlanta was ready for the stage, the world stage. And they did their thing, man. It was beautiful. The Olympics came to Atlanta and changed the trajectory of Atlanta in the country. At the same time, because of Maynard Jackson, the Atlanta airport was taking off, right? And becoming an international hub. Yeah, once you do the Olympic Games, you are then in an international city. You are now a global player. The world had to come to your, you know, your city. And so when the world came here, they got to see what Atlanta felt like. You know, there's only been three or four uh, American cities that have hosted the Olympic Games. Um, Atlanta's just special. We always punch above our weight. People, you know, discount us and don't know that we are as big as we are because they talk about the coasts, you know. Like we used to say, we have no sand, no beaches, just these Georgia peaches. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, they go back to free beaches. So. Um, <laughs> but if you got all that, people start picking up on, you know, hey, it's the people that make a culture. Well, the biggest influence on me was seeing that we could win because I was, I was doubting it till the very end. I just thought it was too big a dream. And then I learned no such thing. Dreams are big. Author, on behalf of soccer fans across America, it is my pleasure to welcome the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, to Major League Soccer. Can't wait for 2017. <laughs> And in some ways, Atlanta United, when you look at it, when you go to a game, and when you think about it, it really is kind of the culmination of a lot of the work that started in the 70s. Some people would say it started earlier than that. I would say it started in 1895. And then at various times, like the 1990s, we basically declared that not only were we going to be an international city, but that we are an international city. Right on time, bro. I ain't gonna hold you. Atlanta United coming into this city is right on time, bro. Like, having a team that wins, Atlanta United, is all that energy that I, I'm just like, yes, more. I, it's good to see a team that's victorious. It's good to see a team that unifies the people on, a, on like I said, on a global scale, on a global yeah. type of sport. You know what I'm saying? I see all the cultures of Atlanta at the Atlanta United game. Yeah. I don't just see, like, you know what I'm saying? It's not just black people. Not it's black literally everybody. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's in those games.
That's kind of that's beautiful. That's like that, that. It makes the city feel bigger. It's like what the Olympics did for us. It's like what you know. what I'm saying Manny Jackson getting Hartfield Jackson International Airport did for us. All those things making Atlanta a global city and Atlanta United is just the the latest stamp of being like yes, Atlanta is a global city like Toronto, like yeah. New York. Like, like Paris, LA, like Paris, like Dubai, you know what I'm saying? Like Lagos, Atlanta is a global city. We appreciate everything Atlanta United doing for us. Yeah. And they came in asking a lot of questions and doing a lot of community engagement work before before a game was ever played. And, and, and they did their due diligence. Once Atlanta United did the championship right, that's a, that's a do. So you can say we champions, anybody can say, but you gotta physically become a champion. And so now moving forward, as my guy Rohit would say, now the South's got something to do. I'm in Magic City, so it's a, it's a day shift. Like, I'm just there for, for the food, right? For the food, right? You know, the wings are great. Shout out to Lulu Will. So I'm there for the wings and, and then, you know, it's getting late and, and and I just hear these whispers and I, I see movements like tables are like kind of, you know, setting up and I always know what that means. And when I see certain faces, but I didn't know who none of these faces were, right? And so next thing I know, the door is open and it's like a bunch of team, whole people holding up jerseys and trophies. And I hear, this is the Atlanta United, DJ, Atlanta United in the building, they just won the, the trophy. And I see the trophy like on the stage while like a dancer is dancing and I'm like, this is so Atlanta. Like I'm eating my lemon pepper wing, the, a, a soccer team. I, I hadn't even been, but a soccer team, not the Hawks, I would expect that. The Falcons, I would expect that. But a soccer team was in Magic City with the trophy too, in their rings and having a great time. Watching Atlanta United and watching not only how it's embraced the culture, but how the culture has embraced it and then how it's reflected, that's been really dope. You know, the various, you know, social, um, you know, cultural re relevance of Atlanta is extremely high right now. Atlanta definitely influences everything and everybody comes here to make sure they get a taste of this culture and I think uh, the future's bright for the city. A lot of the stuff that we see right now, it, it, it is a result of somebody back then in the 90s saying, you know what, we should do it like this to make sure the next generation and the next generation that they have, you know, some benefit from the position we hold today. Atlanta never got whack. We never had whack juice on us, right? The sauce kept going and, you know, all those artists in the next two decades, you know, kept uh, being discovered and, and the music kept coming out of the South. So again, I think the 90s really set the tone for where we are right now in hip hop. And again, when people think of Atlanta and its music, it's no longer just Southern hip hop, right? It's just hip hop and you can go anywhere in the world. I don't care if you're in, I mean, I was in Israel, literally in Jerusalem at the Western Wall and saw kids in the cypher dancing out to an Atlanta song and I thought, wow. This is kind of cool, and then it was almost like a spiritual moment for me because I was like, I was there at the birth, birthplace of where all this generated, right, with sudden hip hop, and to now be in like Jerusalem at the Western Wall and seeing these kids in a cipher. I can't remember who, if it was Jeezy or somebody, but I was like, okay, wow, this is pretty cool. Nobody does it better when it comes to showing how the nation should handle our problems. It's going to be bigotry, there's gonna be hatred, but Atlanta has always been ahead on that concept. It's always been revolutionary and innovative on how we coexist. I would say we probably are the most hustle-minded, hustle-forward generation. Like, they was hustling, don't, don't get me wrong, they was definitely hustling back in the day. Like, like, like you said, Jeezy literally wrote the book on hustling, but like, we are the people that the book was written for. We know about the deals we want, we know about the brands we want, we know about that, we, we're a little, you think about that on a different kind of spectrum because we've seen the possibilities that happened before it. Uh, I would also say that we, we're taking it global, you know yeah. what I'm saying, like, like we're taking it global, our generation is taking it global. Shout out to the, to the generation that came before us because, like they said, they put the South on the map, they put the South on the map for hip hop. I think that the thing is though, you, you don't know, hindsight they say it's 2020, you know what I mean, like when you in it, 
you, you just in it in the, in the moment. And then as time progresses, you, you can look back and be like, wow, like I, I didn't, you, you don't know because you you like in the, in the eye of the hurricane, you know what I'm saying? But to look back now, you know, Southern Playlist could be 30 years next year, you know what I mean? Wanted to live nowhere but here. Like I never moved to LA, never bought a house in LA, never bought a house in New York, but Atlanta got my heart, man, for sure. When you think about these, you know, the, the Atlanta, you know, the, the the people that come here from different states to and make this their home, um, that say a lot about about, about the city. That's what um, you know. I, I love the city, and they, you know, they open they open it up for me, and um, I, and, I, and I'm, I made it my home. I always feel a responsibility to to take Atlanta to the world because one, it's it's just something that's done so much for me, and I know that when people come here who are from out of town. They get inspired. It's like you, you get around the musicians, it's infectious. You go to the games, it's infectious. Uh, you listen to the radio, you now we got the film industry here. It's just like there's so much happening here that I have to continue to just let people know like Atlanta is just where it's at. Atlanta absolutely influences everything. And and, and everything from the reason why Biggie wore a Kango, Biggie didn't wear Kango, so he came down here to the the, the, the picnic that Shanti Dawes famously threw, you know, it, influ it influences everything because Puffy had the good sense when he shot Outkast's video to show the true Atlanta from Montrez up, not from the Peachtree Plaza down. So absolutely, we've been, we, we, we have, we do, and we always will influence everything.